Hi, folks. Can you hear me, Beal? Okay. We're gonna, uh, my name is Rita Liberti. I'm a professor in kinesiology, and I direct the Center for Sport and Social Justice. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> there's my, besides my mother, there's my one fan. Um, really, thank you all for coming today. Uh, we're delighted to have you here. And uh, before I say another word, we're gonna see a video. Naomi Atias of the U.S. set an Olympic mark in the semifinals of the 100-meter dash, and now in the finals, she runs her rivals into the ground to reach the tape in 11 and 4 tenths seconds. She upsets her teammate, Edith McGuire, by two yards as she flies across. Yes, the American Eagle flies high in Tokyo. Yeah, what, uh, what you just saw was the 100-meter uh, final, 1964 Tokyo Olympics. And the two women that came in first and second in that race are with us today. Wyomi Atias. <laughs> Wyomi Atias, closest to me, and Edith McGuire Duval, furthest from me. Uh, I want to say a, a few words of introduction about our guests. And as I was putting these notes together, I just realized what a, what a difficult task it was. Um, not because there's nothing to say about them, because there's so much to say about them. And I just feel as though for every sentence in here, there could be another 20 sentences, but uh, you're here to see them, not me. Edith McGuire was among the best track athletes in the nation and the world in the 1960s. She won six amateur athletic union championships and the only American woman ever to hold three AAU titles at different times in the 100 and 200 meters and the long jump. Her Olympic gold medal win in the 200 meter in world record time at the Tokyo Games in 1964 was one of McGuire's many athletic achievements. As we just saw at the 1964 Olympics, McGuire also won the silver medal in the 100 meters, as well as another silver in the four by 100 meter relay. Her strong showing at the Tokyo Olympics earned McGuire a top 10 finalist spot for the Sullivan Award, the nation's most prestigious amateur athlete award. Her hometown of Atlanta, Georgia, declared January 29th, 1965, Edith McGuire Day. Duval was inducted into the Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame in 1975, the U.S. National Track and Field Hall of Fame in 1979, and the Georgia Sports Hall of Fame in 1980. McGuire Duval was the 1991 recipient of the National Collegiate Athletic Association's Silver Anniversary Award. The award recognizes former student athletes who have gone on to distinguished careers 25 years after completing their college athletic experiences. Upon earning her undergraduate degree in education from Tennessee State in 1966, McGuire taught for several years in, in underserved communities around the nation. In subsequent years, she and her husband Charles's successful business career afforded McGuire Duval other ways to give back to her community supporting organizations whose aim it is to assist underprivileged individuals and groups, some of them uh, right here in the Bay Area. We are thrilled that Edith McGuire Duval is with us today. Thank you. And it sounds like we're competing with somebody here, so I'm just gonna talk louder and yeah. In the film clip we just saw, 19-year-old Wyomi Atias sprinted to a gold medal in the 100 meter dash at the 1964 Tokyo Games. Four years later, at 19, in 1968 Olympics in Mexico City, she once again won gold in the event, becoming the first person, male or female, to win back-to-back -back Olympic gold medals in the 100 meter race. It would be another 20 years before Olympian Carl Lewis could match Wyomi Atias' back-to-back 100 meter victories. In addition to her 100 meter first place finishes, Tyus won a third Olympic gold medal in the four by 100 meter relay in Mexico City and a silver medal in the same event four years earlier in Tokyo. Accolades followed Tyus's athletic achievements. In 1969, the governor of Georgia named January 25th, 1969, Wyoming a Tyus Day. This honor was followed by her induction into the Georgia Sports Hall of Fame in 1976 the National Track and Field Hall of Fame in 1980,
the International Women's Sports Hall of Fame in 1981 and the Olympic Hall of Fame in 1985. In the mid-1970s, Tyus became a founding member of the Women's Sports Foundation, an organization that has sought over the past several decades to advance the lives of girls and women through sport. In the 1990s, her hometown of Griffin, Georgia, dedicated the 164-acre Wyoming Tyus Olympic Park in her honor. Tyus, a 1968 graduate in recreation at Tennessee State, landed her quote-unquote dream job in the 1990s, working as a naturalist for the Los Angeles Unified School District. It seems fitting that the many young people under Tyus's guidance learned about the world around them through physical activity. This is Ms. Tyus's second speaking engagement on our campus in just the last two years. We're making something of a habit of it, and we'd love to have her back and any other Tiger Bells she'd like to bring to Cal State East Bay every year. In the 1960s, McGuire Duvall and Tyus were members of the extraordinary Tennessee State Tiger Bells track program. The Tiger Bells were, arguably, one of the most successful athletic programs in history. Under the direction of head coach Ed Temple, who was at the university from 1950 to 1993, uh, he served as a sociology professor and also coach of the women's track team. This small, historically black college produced 40 Olympians, 23 of whom won Olympic medals. The program won an absolutely incredible 34 national titles. Eight Tiger Bells, including our guests today, have been inducted into the National Track and Field Hall of Fame. Long before more contemporary women's athletic dynasties, including the University of Connecticut basketball program or the University of North Carolina soccer team, took to the court and field respectively, the Tennessee State Tiger Bells blazed around the track, dominating national and international athletic competition for years. Their success gives us a whole new definition of athletic dominance. These individual and team statistics I've cited are phenomenal and in and of themselves deserving of our attention and our praise. But to try and measure Tyus and McGuire Duvall's contribution to history as simply a sum of victories of, or gold medals earned in international athletic competitions is far too narrow a view of their historical significance. In the 1960s, athletic womanhood was, for the most part, frowned upon and scorned. Despite societal ambivalence towards female athletes, Tennessee State's program advanced elite track opportunities for female students years before the passage of Title IX in the early 1970s. In many ways, educators like Tennessee State's women's track coach, Ed Temple, understood that black women needed to hone as many skills as possible to enter a world that was not necessarily eager to greet them. Track and sport more generally became a laboratory of sorts to foster and encourage any number of skills qualities including perseverance, tenacity, and strength, all serving as tools to combat the realities of racism and sexism. The experiences of Wyoming Atias, Edith McGuire Duvall, and their Tiger Bell teammates are significant to our nation's history because they tell us so much about the many ways in which African American women excelled to be the best in the world at what they did this as societal norms and practices actively sought to deny them opportunities to even exist. For these and so many other reasons, they are remarkable women, so worthy of our collective admiration. Please join me in welcoming Wyomi Atias and Edith McGuire Duvall. Uh, well, thank you again for thank joining you. us. It's, uh, as a sport historian, I have to say that this is, uh, could be the highlight professionally of uh, my life, <laughs> getting to sit with two Tiger Bells. Thank you for having us. Um, I thought we'd start, if you wouldn't mind, um, I mentioned a few remarks about your early lives, but if you could tell us a little bit about uh, growing up in Georgia and how you found your way to the track. Well, yeah. I think you should start, okay. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because you started before me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having us. Uh, this is really a great pleasure, and it's really great, one reason, because as we get older, it's really good to know that folks still remember, you know, remember us. Well, I'm originally from Atlanta, Georgia, um, where I grew up with uh, two sisters and a brother. Um, they were all two years apart. I was eight, ten, 
and 12 years younger than them. So I think I was there. Oops, I think. <laughs> but anyway, I was the only one who was athletic, and um, I always played in the street with the boys. I was a tomboy. I consider myself a tomboy because I always played in the street with the boys. And I was one of the girls that they would choose to be on their team if we played big ball or whatever it was that we were playing. And so I always was very active. But in my elementary school, we did not have um, a phys education program. Uh, we only had um, a playground teacher who would come maybe two or three times a week, and that was after school. But once I went to high school, uh, that is when I got into sports. I played basketball, ran track, and was a cheerleader during um, the football uh, season. And all my friends, we all participated in everything. From September to June, uh, we were very, uh, very active. And then in 1960, the year that Wilma Rudolph went to the Olympics, uh, I was asked to go to Tennessee State for Coach Temple's summer program. And he, he had a summer program. He was able to have this summer program because he was the only school with a team for girls. And this was, of course, before Title IX. And so he had a summer program where he always invited uh, high school students up, high school girls up during the summer and we trained with them, and we went to the nationals, uh, the national meets. And in 1960, I was able to go uh, to Tennessee State. The nationals and the Olympic trials were in Texas. And I actually participated in the um, Olympic trials, because Coach Temple would always put the juniors in um, the events with the seniors. And I was a long jumper, as Rita mentioned. And I jumped um, probably about 18 feet, further than I had ever jumped before <laughs> in my life. I jumped, I screamed, and Coach Timber thought I had made the Olympic team. <laughs> I said, no, I just uh, jumped further than I've ever jumped in my life. And then the, the next year was my senior year. I graduated, went back to Tennessee State during the summer program and uh, he brought me back that year. And I had a great thing that happened to me. I actually made an international team in the long jump. Mm -hmm. And that was my first team. And I got a, an opportunity to go to uh, Russia, uh, Poland, Germany, and England. Wow. And I think that was Wyoming's first year um, that she came uh, doing high school. And that's when we first met um, in 1962. And we've been buddies ever since. <laughs> so that's a little bit about my, how I got to Tennessee. Well, mine is a little bit different. I grew up in Georgia also. I grew up in Griffin, Georgia, which was about 40 miles south of Atlanta. I grew up on a dairy farm with three older brothers. No, we didn't own the dairy farm. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> but my, it was a form of sharecropping. I don't know if you guys ever heard of sharecropping, but uh, what it is, you work for the person that owns the land and you pretty much get to stay there free, but you, you're, well, your family works there. Uh, my parents, my dad and, and mom never wanted us to ever work to dairy farm, so we, our job was to go to school and get an education. And my father would always say, I, I have worked hard enough and I don't ever want my kids to ever have to work this hard. I don't ever want my kids to pick cotton. I don't want to let my kids do this. So he's working hard for us to have a better life. And that's how I grew up. Now, growing up with three older brothers is something else. But um, because of them, I'm up here on the stage, I think, because uh, I had to learn to not only run to keep up with them, I also had to learn to run away from some of the fights that we would have. But, so we had, I grew up really enjoying my childhood because I got to play with all, I played with my brothers all the time. That was all I had to play with. It was just me and my brothers. And, and the dairy farm where I lived, it was in a white community. So I grew up, with, it was just our black family and a white community. So I played with boys all the time because white girls were not allowed to play with us. And definitely could not play with black boys. So. I played with the boys all the time, white boys, it didn't matter, but we played all the time. But it was always funny to me because 
we would go out and play and nobody wants a girl on their team. A girl on your team, you can't have a girl on your team. And my brothers would reluctantly say, oh, we'll take her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they knew what I could do because I had to be good <laughs> and, and I was. So I, I started out very early in sports doing, playing with my brothers. And at the time when I was competing, I think same time then, was I played basketball. They only had basketball and track for women. And that's what we did. And when we talk about for women, we're only talking, we were, our school's not in grade. We went to all black schools, you know, nobody in our school. I mean, I, don't, I never in all my career had a white teacher, even at college. So, uh, so anyway, to get back to my childhood. Uh, so I grew up, you know, just playing basketball, football, and baseball, and who can ride the bicycle fastest, who can climb the tree fastest, and all those kind of things. So that's how my track career started, and I met Coach Temple and when I was at, I'm 61, and he invited me to the same camp that Edith was. But Edith didn't know it. I used to watch her run, because I, <laughs> it, as a, uh, we used to meet at Fort Valley State. We had our, what we call our state track meet. And uh, my coach, I never forget, my coach always would say to me, you see her? You need to learn to run like that. <laughs> Edie was beautiful right at perfect form and all of that. And I'm like, ah, oh, get me down the track. <laughs> And, uh, and she used to tell me that, and I thought, well, maybe you should coach me that way, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, that was, you know, and it started there, and that summer, uh, that, while I was at that Fort Valley track meet, Coach Temple came up to me and asked me if I would be interested in coming to his, the camp, the summer camp. And I'm like, sure, it sounds good, and there's nothing to do with Griffin, I tell you. <laughs> and, uh, so I went there that summer, and that's how it started off. And, I must say, I didn't, my first summer there, I didn't like it. <laughs> the workouts were too hard and I really wanted to go home. Mm -hmm. And my parent, my call, well, my father died before I even got an opportunity for him to even see me die before I went there that summer. But uh, I, don't, I could just remember calling my mom and saying, this is too hard and I can't do this. And not only that, this man has changed my running style and he's saying it's going to be the best. And I was used to winning. <laughs> I was getting beat every day. <laughs> and uh, we have time trials. I, and, you know, I was not first. I was not second. <laughs> yeah, I was third, fourth, fifth something a lot of times. But it was a learning lesson. And that's pretty much how my career started. Uh, but my mom made me stay. And it was the best thing in the world that happened to me. I couldn't wait to get back the next summer. And the next mm. So that's. I was, I was going to ask what your mother said. <laughs> they, you actually went back, to, basically, what she said to me was, Look, you wanted to go. You don't have to go next year, but you got to finish this year. Mm -hmm. So that's what happened. Um, Edith, you mentioned the word tomboy. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you could, if you both could talk a little bit about, you know, being a young girl and loving to do sport in a world that many young girls either weren't socialized to do that. If you. If being a tomboy was like a badge of honor, or was it kind of you were ridiculed for wanting to play sport? Did anybody frown upon you wanting to do that? Well, my family did, and I know at the school they did, because my coaches and teachers at school, in, in high school really, that's where I was really encouraged. Uh, I can recall um, with the track team when I was in high school, um, and I always thought that I'm a little bit like Tyson, I can do this. But when, you, when you're young, sometimes they put you, like when I was in the ninth grade, they just automatically put me on the B team. But I was a little upset about that because I felt like I, some of those girls on the basketball team that I could be. But in the 10th grade, I got a chance to be on the basketball team. And there was a coach, well, he was actually the athletic director, um, and we called him Coach Rainwright. Um, Whenever we got ready for a track meet, we had this big box with shoes in it. And everybody going in, you try and find you some shoes. Well, Coach Rainwright took me downtown to uh, the sporting goods store downtown in Atlanta, and I had my own track shoes. <laughs> and uh, I think, <laughs> well, I think, too, he saw, he, I guess he saw something in me, and, and I played basketball, and I ran track. And one of the funny things is that Coach Temple never promised you a scholarship. 
you know, you had to come back that year, that's last summer, and, and if you did well, then, you know, he offered you the scholarship. But he didn't do it ahead of time. So my senior year, uh, Coach Rainwright called Coach Temple to see if, you know, if he could, he was going to offer me a scholarship. And he said, I don't, I don't do that. And so, but at graduation, we all were sure that I was going to go to Tennessee State. So Co Coach Rainwright had them, because at that time they would announce where you got a scholarship. So he had them announce that Edith McGuire had a scholarship to Tennessee <laughs> State, <laughs> although Coach Templehan said, said that. But, yeah. At, oh, you asked me about the tomboy. I didn't, I didn't take it as a negative thing because I enjoyed playing. I enjoyed playing. And, and as I think about it, no one really uh, teased me or anything uh, you know, about it. Because like I said, the boys would choose me to be on their team. So. Well, it's pretty much the same. I mean, the tomboy, when you think of, um, when I think about it, it did have kind of a double edge. So there were the people there that was encouraging you about it, and there were people in uh, in my family even saying, "Oh God, she should not be, a, you know, doing all these things. That's not for girls. It's not ladylike. She's going to develop muscles. What man would want her with muscles?" Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was those kinds of things, but. Because uh, I enjoyed what I like. I enjoy sports. Mm -hmm. I enjoy being active. I did not let that bother me. And when we're talking family members, so it kind of you hear it a lot. But uh, so you, you know, it was just something you had to. And then you would hear from some other people. Oh, it's great you can do this. It's great you can do. You know, you're so good at basketball. How you get so good at basketball? And somebody may say, because you're a tomboy. She play with all those boys all the time. That's why she knows how to do all these things. And it was not like, you know, you were never encouraged as a young girl. We, uh, we say, I was never encouraged. To, you know, I, you encourage boys. They always, yeah, go ahead and do that, you know. And if you get knocked down, you just get up and try it again. That was not a, a sister, uh, something that was said to young women that were involved in sports or wanted to be involved in sports. You were supposed to be kind of dainty. Well, there was no ice skating and things like that. <laughs> you know, the sports in which we competed and called for sweating. Yeah. <laughs> they called, not perspiration, sweating. <laughs> they called for that. And in that day and time, in that era, you know, that's how people were thinking. Women were supposed to be more dainty, so well, ladylike. And they, of course, there are going to be people that were saying, okay, it's fine if you or a Tom Buzz, find it that you, they want to see you look good. And when you would go out and your team would win, and you say if you scored all the, most of the points on the team, they were happy. If you go out and you bring all these uh, awards back, they were happy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, know, so, you know, it was always, I never thought about it. I mean, it was okay if what you thought about me, because I felt good about who I am. I'm, I'm going to ask actually a few more questions and then we're going to open it up just to give you a sense of how I, I could sit up here for six hours, but, <laughs> but I won't do that. We wouldn't do that. I wondered, you know, I mentioned a little bit about uh, the Tennessee State, the Tiger Bell program and what a dynasty uh, it was. I'm wondering if you could just tell us um, what, what you want folks to know about the Tiger Bells. I mean, some folks probably don't know anything about the Tiger Bells, but like beyond the statistics and stuff. What do, you, what do you want us to take away about the program, the people, the school? Well, I think for us, you think, you're talking about a group of women, a group of black women, and, and growing up, again, we're in the South, in the Jim Crow South, and things are not, you're not, Coach Temple used to say to us all the time, you know, you can go out and win gold medals and be known all over the world, and you come back to your home country, and they're not gonna recognize you, and they're not gonna give you the recognition and what you deserve. But that's not what it's about. It's about getting an education. And that's what Coach Temple, that was his goal. All his girls should get an education. Because he would always say, uh, ed, you know, track could open the door, education would keep it open. Mm -hmm. And that's was it. And he wanted us to make sure we got our education. And all the girls that were on his team, all the years that he coached, he had a 98.6 graduation rate. Wow. And that this 0.6 is because the other couple, few girls, 
graduated from another university, didn't graduate from Tennessee State. Mm -hmm. So basically, he had a 100% graduation rate. So and that's what the Tiger Bells were about. Not only was that, when you think about track, you think of track as being a individual sport, but he coached it so it was a team sport. We were a team. You know, we helped out, not only on the track, you helped out when, when say, so your teammate may need help in a class. Right. You need this, you, you, and I can remember in the summer times when we were common, I'm a youngster, <laughs> and um, the older girls, he would always say, well, you have the older girls, you have the younger girls, and when we couldn't go downtown, we couldn't go to a movie or anything without the old, some older girl being with us. And they had to show us the ropes, and that's what he would say. You need to teach them. You know, the, well, his main thing was, you need to be a lady first. Always got to be a lady. And, and what he says, that's, you know, he, he would just hook you up with, another Tiger Bell or some Tiger Bell. You may even make friends with the older Tiger Bell and all that, but you could, you know, they were to teach you how to do things, mm -hmm. how to do your hair, how to wear your clothes, how to speak, how to talk, you know. And uh, that was, to me, that was what being a Tiger Bell was. It was not just about running. It was about being an, a person, become, growing into who you are, growing into being, uh, a productive person in our community, in our world today, and uh, and you do that as a team. You cannot, you know, you don't, you know, you run track as individual, but as a team, you need everybody's help. You know, you need everybody to come in and uh, help out because there's always good. You know, it's like I always say, there's always somebody that's faster than me. You know, and uh, there's nothing wrong with that. But hopefully, I'm going to be fast today we run this. <laughs> hopefully. But uh, you never know. So, you, you know, there's always somebody out there that can do something better than you. That doesn't mean you're not good. Doesn't mean you're not great. It's just, it's, that's just life. It's just life. And you mentioned that there were 40, 40 girls that he put on the Olympic team. Those, are not, those 40 girls finished college, but he had plenty of girls that did not make an Olympic team, and uh, they finished college. Um, we have one that we really see a lot mm -hmm. now and associate with. She came there, and, and this was the great part about, I guess, that I loved about, one of the things I loved about him, that he always said that there's life after track. Mm -hmm. You know, he, if you weren't there just for track, but there was life after, after track. And there's a, a young lady, her name is Carrie, uh, uh, Carrie, Harris Allen. Harris, uh, Harris Allen. Allen. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Carrie came there uh, as a walk-on. And, uh, and a few other girls would come as walk-ons. And, you know, he had a time in which he would weed them out. But, uh, so if they didn't look good as far as, like, they would make the team, uh, the running team, he, he, I remember Carrie said it was three of them. And he sat them down and he said, now, um, I'll put you on the team, but you have to be a manager, a trainer. Mm -hmm. And then he, she said he went through all this stuff, almost like he was saying, you're going to have to be the girl's maid, <laughs> basically. <laughs> he made it sound really bad, but he wanted to make it sound that way so that if they really wanted to do it. And so Carrie, I think of the three, Carrie was the only one. Carrie said, my mother paid for one semester school. And after that, she was on the team. And then she'll tell you, and then eventually I even got a chance to travel with the team. <laughs> you know, so she yeah. got an education, although she did not uh, run. But she, and she had to go to practice every day, 3 o'clock, same as we did. She had to be there in the summertime, just like us. And so he gave educa people got girls got education other than the ones who were running. Yeah. And some of them that was running got education, but they, they weren't Olympians. Yeah. And that's a great part, one of the great things I loved about him. Uh -huh. yeah. And then when she said not even Olympians, they may not even have made a team, right. mm -hmm. team, but they still got to be a part of the Tiger Bills. They still mm -hmm. got to be a part of us. And he, he made sure that he was just all about education. And that was, and, and it's still that way today. Education can open that, keep that door open, take you in so many different places. Mm -hmm. And and one another thing about being a Tiger Bell and running, Mr. Temple would always say to us that 
you know, I don't care who you have as friends, but all your friends cannot be uh, an athlete. Mm -hmm. You need to have friends in every area, all, because mm -hmm. you never know when you, you need to learn so much from other people because you never know when you're going to have to sit at a table with kings or presidents <laughs> or in front of an audience like you guys. And you have to be able to talk to them, and, uh, not just talk about track, but talk about other things that matter in this world. And by the way, Ed Temple, their coach, passed away this past fall. Um, I think he, he, as I said, he retired in the early 1990s yes. Yes. Um, and continued to be a huge supporter of the Tennessee State program. I think what I'd like to do is, is open it up. Uh, Mary, is that, is that okay? Can I do that? Um, and we'd, we'd love to have uh, your questions. I, again, have several more questions, but um, I don't want to monopolize. So uh, if anyone has questions for our guests, please feel free. Hello, uh, Wyomia and Edith. Uh, thank you for coming today. Mm -hmm. um, one, th this question is for the both of you. While you two were both on the Olympic teams in the 60s, um, and you two participated as cultural ambassadors, am I correct? Yes. Uh, how did you feel about that program, and what countries did you visit uh, due to that? Uh, we were Goodwill Ambassadors. We only went to Africa, and that was in 1966. Is that what, that was your question about the, and, right. In 1966, uh, Wyoming and Coach Temple, just the three of us went. We went to Ethiopia and to Kenya, and uh, I guess we were gone about a month. We traveled, uh, traveled around, and we did uh, track clinics. Coach Temple talked, we demonstrated. <laughs> <laughs> and we got a chance to, you know, meet. Visit, see the country. You know, visit the country and meet a lot of different folks. And it was really, it, it was quite interesting. And they, we were very young then, because yeah. I think that was in 66. The other part of our tour, too, of being Goodwin Ambassadors, one reason they sent us over, because they were uh, encouraging young African women to get involved in sports. They were trying to get them to get involved in sports because they were, they were not ever, they were not encouraged, you know, they encouraged their, the, the, uh, the male to get involved in sports, but they never were encouraging the women there to get involved. So we were like an example of what could happen, so to speak, <laughs> if you got involved and it was okay to be involved in sports. and. Um, I was telling, I don't know if I told Rita, I told the story a minute ago earlier that we were there and uh, like guys were saying, we, we were doing demonstrations and they were like, we want to run against you, we want to, we can beat you. And, and uh, <laughs> we were like, mm -mm. <laughs> But uh, one guy just said, oh yes, he wanted to run against us. If a woman beat me, I'll kill myself. Blah, blah, blah. He's and, dead. <laughs> He got beat, so I don't know. We, <laughs> so that, but it was, and it was a great trip. I mean, it was, you know, I we enjoyed it. We learned, I learned a lot about the country, and and also about ourselves too. And we had talked about it earlier that they had had uh, goodwill ambassadors, but they had always been men. Mm -hmm. They had not sent women. Yes. Uh, Rudolph went in, did, did Rudolph she go, go in 63, but not? Well, maybe she did. She went to Ghana, I, not the nations you went to. But we think. went with Coach Temple. Yes, yeah, she, did, she did not go with Coach Temple. No. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I think there was a question, question over here. Yeah. Okay, we, okay, stick, stick. Stick, 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 stick. That's right. stick. That's right. <laughs> oh, I keep forgetting. I'm with young people. I work with young people so long. So it's okay. I'm one of the older students here. <laughs> okay. Um, so it's wonderful to have both of you here today. And um, it's wonderful to have you both here today. And um, I can't help but um, wonder what it was like to uh, to be uh, 
a, a well-known athlete, athletes uh, in the in the 60s when things were really rough here. I mean, we were going through some transitions, and then uh, all of a sudden we were dealing with the assassination of Martin Luther King. And I'm just wondering how, if that affected, if that affected um, the way um, and the way that you. Um, kind of went forth in, edu in helping other people understand what was going on at that time. How did you, as, as public leaders, um, deal with that? I don't know if I really looked at myself as a, a public leader. I know that when, when Wyoming and I returned from the uh, Olympics in 64, and with both of us being from uh, Georgia and, and Tennessee State, we were only greeted by our people. We were not greeted by the city of, it, of Atlanta. And for, for the state to have a gold medal and a silver medal winner in the same event, um, you know, it was somewhat disturbing, but this is, that was the life that we were living, you know, at that time. And our, our people really, um, welcome us, um, and, and, and it was difficult because you figure you're, you're participating for the U.S., so it shouldn't just be your community that's, that's uh, rejoicing the fact that you won, but that was what was happening during, you know, during that time, and, and, and you know, we dealt with it. And then, you know, like you said, when we came back, now in Tennessee, they, I mean, our, like when we got off the airplane from Tokyo, the, our whole school, not whole school, but a lot of people from our school was there. But, at, but we stayed in Nashville for a few days mm -hmm. afterwards, and we didn't have a parade there, though. But yeah, we yeah. got to meet, you know, we got the key to the city, we got this, we got that. It didn't open much. But we had the key, <laughs> but we had the key and all those things. And, but, and as you said, we went back to Atlanta, and they gave us a parade in Atlanta, but it only went through the black community. So I guess we only won our medals for them. I don't know. But it, no, but that, but Coach Temple, one good thing about it, and that's a whole another thing, you know, he prepared us as best as he possibly could for whatever we might run into, mm -hmm. especially being black women from the South and not getting recognition. And not, you don't get recognition because you're black, you don't get recognition because you're a woman. And, I, and he, but he prepared us if there's anything for prepared. preparing me. He educated us that hey, there are obstacles in the road. You know, you cannot let these things get you down. You keep trying. You keep working hard because it may not happen on your watch. It's, but if you keep it going and you keep your head up and you keep doing these things, somebody's going to recognize it. And I always say pioneers are the last ones to get recognized. And it's okay because you know you've had a place in history and you have done what you could do to help history in itself. And, and we never looked at it as we knew what we were good. We knew we were good out on the track. We knew we were good people. We knew we were good at uh, getting a college education. And we, I, I would like to speak for all Tiger Bill saying, I think we all felt that, you know, what we did was not just for us, it was for the world and for the country and all of that. And, and through all of that, through all the racism and sexism, in America, we still overcame. We still kept going. We would not let that get us down. And you know, sometimes I have you have people now asking, "Well, well, how do you feel?" Because now they're making all that money, <laughs> and I say, "Well, you know, they wouldn't be there if it wasn't for us." So it took, you know, the beginning with the early on when women started participating in in uh, sports and in the Olympics and all the different events that it took those people. And I can't look back, I can't look and say, oh, uh, I can't live in the future saying if, if, if I was, you know, 50 years younger, <laughs> what I would do. So I just glad that it did come to the fact where they are making money, although I think it kind of hurt the sport a little bit in that that money came in, but um, 
I praise him. And it, then when she said making money, there are a lot of a lot of uh, sports the women are not making the same as men. Right. Yeah. So uh, you know you would think that, but they're not. <laughs> you would think, well, they're just as good as that guy. Yeah, but they're not. Their money is not that good. good. And it, you know, and when you start talking about that and saying about the money, and people start saying, oh, that you just want the money. It's just well, no. We just want an equal playing field. And the equal playing field means that, I mean, that's one reason for Title IX, so you can have an equal playing field as far as sports is involved. So in the equal playing field also, you want, if you're giving a million dollars to a race car driver and it's a male, you need to give a million dollars to the race car driver. That's all. Simple as that, in my life anyway. <laughs> and I'll share this with you. We went to school on what they call work study. So we all had a job that we had to go to five days a week, two hours a day. We did not, it was not, we said scholarship, but it was not a scholarship, it was work study. And um, Coach Temple tried to get us with some people who weren't gonna kill us two hours a day because <laughs> we had to go to practice at three o'clock. And I basically worked for the same person the whole time I was in school, I worked for the ROTC. And uh, I had a good boss, and uh, my work was almost at the beginning of each semester. Um, but um, we all worked on, had work study. Um, we got uh, what they call laundry, was it called laundry? Per diem. Per diem. Uh, was it $2 a day? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, so this is, you know, this is what we, what we dealt with, uh, you know, in the very beginning with, with going to school. And, no scholarship. We all had jobs. Um, Coach Temple uh, helped with books, and we passed books from one person to the other. You know, when we bought books, because books were not included, either. So your family or whoever had to help with buying, you know, buying the books. But uh, we all made it work, and we all got through. If I, if I could real quick, um, earlier today at a luncheon, uh, Terry Jones, who was a former professor here at Cal State East Bay in sociology and social services, um, had a few remarks to say. He's known Edith for years, as I understand it. And just hearing what you just said, I mean, I think that what he was saying to us was that they may not have considered themselves to be race leaders, but the African Americans who saw them run in the 1960s and realized what they were doing, they were very, very much um, race leaders, and uh, I think advancing the cause for women as well at the same time. Hey, Mary, is there a way we can get that image up, that yeah. one of the bouffants? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, if I, while you guys are thinking of your next question, um, we had a good laugh over this earlier, talking about how the Tiger Bells did, did not get media attention. They rarely got media attention, and they certainly never made the cover of Sports Illustrated, which at the time was the premier sports magazine, right? <laughs> Folks, this is a, this is a, a cover and a, a several page article inside April 1964. So in the months just leading up to the Tokyo Games, Sports Illustrated decides to highlight a group of white women, and I'll let these ladies tell you a little <laughs> bit about these women, um, decides to highlight these women on the cover of the magazine, even though the world knew, really, anybody who knew anything, it was going to be the Tennessee State Tiger Bells that were going to dominate the 1964 track of the Olympics. So you want to tell us a little bit about this? Well, they're called the I, no, we, we call them Bouffant Bell because yeah. of, <laughs> of the hairstyle. And not one of those girls ever made, not one girl ever made an international team, not an Olympic team, just an international uh, team, or probably, not probably, was never in the final eight of an event. <laughs> but they were on the cover of, they had this coach, and um, what was her name, Mamie? Her name was Mamie. She Flamey called, Mamie. Flamey we Mamie. Her. We she called had her real red hair, and she wore it bouffant style. On her. <laughs> and this was a woman who she actually coached, and I guess it was the '65 team, or the '63 team. '63. '63 team that went to uh, Russia, Poland, Germany, and England. Now, usually the coaches of the teams are usually coaches who have put girls on a team. Or some, you know, some way. But anyway, she ended up being the coach of the team, 
and she, we called her Flamin' Mamie, and Flamin' Mamie came out on the track in her tight pants, like what people are wearing now. She, she was wearing those then, and high heel shoes. <laughs> High heel shoes. And, you know, of course, we, you can't imagine how we probably felt about her. <laughs> but anyway, this is, you know, as a result, and I'm sure that she probably had a lot to do with this, this, being, this article being uh, written about her, her girls. And I think also, Edie, you being kind of kind, of, like, you also have to think about the times. It's not so much about them, it's more that, oh, they're white and they were going to put them on the cover, they were never going to put us on the cover. Right. And he was being kind in the fact that she talked about they never made it in there. I don't even think they broke a tape, especially if, <laughs> especially if you know, if there were some teams that had any type of recognition. It didn't have to be the Tiger Bells, it could be but anybody. Like anything, yeah. I can, even in this article, if you look at it, there's a reference where they say, one of them, I don't know which one it is, well, you know, she ran a 11.7 in, no, 11.6 in 100 meters, and Wyoming Tires have only run 11.7. Well, okay. I only ran 11.7 what day? <laughs> and when did she run the 11.6? Well, whoever, she must have done it in practice in the track, as far as I'm concerned, was short. <laughs> I don't know. I, you see my love for that. So. <laughs> well, you know, one thing I used to say all the time, they, this, this thing about time, mm -hmm. because nowadays they're really into, you know, breaking world records and all that. I always say the time has never broke the tape. Mm -hmm. You can run the fastest time on day one, but if on day five you don't run that time and you don't break that tape, that 11-1 or whatever you ran on that day one, yeah. it won't matter. So, and I think when we were running, we weren't into time mm -hmm. like they are now. Yeah. If we broke a record, that was great. But we weren't into every time we hit the track, we had to break a record. We had to break the tape. That's yes, right. <laughs> and the other part of that too, because we were, with being on the Tiger Bells, I tell you, Coach Temple used to tell us all the time, if you could beat the people here, you could yeah, beat anybody, anybody in the world. Yeah. Yeah, and that's how it was. I tell you, you could go to practice, you know, and you could come back from a track meet, and you go, you know, you won all this stuff, and you go to practice, you have a time trial, and you get whipped by three or four Tiger Bells. <laughs> <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> I'm not good. You know? But you know, so you never could get what we call the big head, the god best deal. But uh, yeah, I know the, girls that ran before us that were in the, in the 60 Olympics on the team with Wilma, they were more trash talkers. <laughs> Edith and I were not. <laughs> and one of the things when you, uh, and I don't think I shared this, is that when I went to Tennessee State that first summer, Coach Temple always showed us films of previous meets that the girls, and I remember seeing one and it was a finals, and it was eight girls in the finals, and about five or six of them had Tiger Bell across their chest. And when I saw that, I was 16 years old, and when I saw that, I said, I want to be like them. And like when we were saying how hard we worked, we did, we worked very, very hard. But I still was determined that I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to be a Tiger Bell. But to see, eight people and five or six of them, and that's what you saw. That's what you saw yeah. during that time. Yeah. And, and I would, go, go ahead. I, <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's not a race. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll let you go, because you were talking, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I remember being at a track meet, and a coach passed, now I was a teenager, and a coach passed by and said, I'm not gonna say good luck to you because I know you're going to win, you know, but because we had Tiger Bell, you know, across yeah. our chest. Okay, now. I forgot what I was going to say. I'm sorry. Yeah, but it, it was okay. But well, you see, we're aging. <laughs> we'll just give you more time to ask us questions. So. No? Yes? Great. Okay, we can hear. Oh, one of the things I forgot to mention, thank you for reminding me. 
those of you um, in the audience, we really do need the mic so we can get it recorded because this will appear on our YouTube station, <laughs> the center's YouTube station. So if you don't want to be on film, yeah, put your sunglasses on and just whatever. <laughs> so this. Uh, Oh, let me get my. Oh. Uh, first off, uh, it's an honor. It's a, I, I'm a teacher on spring break, just lounging, and got invited to see. How often do you see one Olympian, let, let, let alone two gold medalists? This is such an honor, and especially the time. I dig the whole concept of uh, discipline uh, in athletics transferring to anything you do in life. And I try to preach that to my students and the people I coach. My question is I, I saw Allison Felix not too long ago. And uh, to me, gym beast, freak of nature. In terms of modern training techniques, periodization, nutrition, you guys ran 11.4, 11.03, that's, that's sick. I mean, and the world record now is only like less than a half second away. I'm curious what you guys would pull now and how much different it was the techniques, training techniques, diet, all that stuff, supplementation. Well, I know Coach Timper really didn't as far as diet, yeah. we ate the food at the cafeteria. A <laughs> <laughs> dollar twenty-five on a meal card. And we had a dollar twenty-five on the meal card for three, three meals. meals. Wow. <laughs> so we ate that food. Um, he didn't really. With Wyoming, he used to have to get after her because she was not a good eater, and so he would have to get on her about eating and eating right. He still got eleven seconds. Yeah, <laughs> but she still was running. But he didn't concentrate on that that much. I remember he once he started to do weights with us, mm -hmm. and he whatever he saw he didn't like, so he stopped doing the the weights with us. Mm -hmm. uh, we did cross country at the beginning of the the year. Everybody had to run. We had to run down. Um, you know, Tennessee State was an agricultural school. At, it was T Tennessee State Agricultural School. And so we had the fields down and we would run down near the tanks and the hill we had to run up. The cars had problems getting up the hill, but <laughs> you know, we had to run up those hills. And then we went indoors for training and outdoors. So he had a, you know, a training schedule where we trained, basically we trained year round, although we had a break in between moving from the cross country training outside to indoors and from indoors to outdoors and a little break in the summer because we ran in the summer also. So we ran basically year round with a few breaks. Um, and you know, he had set schedules, uh, things for us to do. You run uh, wind sprints, you know, 100 meters, 200, um, 300. And everybody at one time had to run a 400 meter and he had a set time. So if you didn't make that time, that meant you had to run it again. So I think what we did, we got our minds together. Okay, we running this 400 meters one time. Because <laughs> you had to meet standards for all the, the races. And we were able to run it. I ran it one time, because I set my mind that, you know, I'm gonna run this and I'm gonna hit that time. But he didn't, all of this nutrition and in, in the gym, with all that equipment. Well, first of all, we didn't have that. Yes, we didn't have that equipment. So our sure thing was exercise, um, running. He did, we worked on form. He worked on Ty's form. <laughs> he did, yes, it was hard. <laughs> we had these, the, because we it was a football field. So we had to get on those lines across the football field and you pumped your arms and raised your knees and this is how you were able to get that, you know, running straight, you know, straight, stand straight down. But yeah, he didn't, all the things that they're doing now, you know, he no. didn't do that. He just believed in a lot of hard, hard work. work. And, he, and he truly believed in a lot of running hills. We yeah. did a lot of hill work and uh, I think that's, you know, that paid off for us. And, he, you know, he was just, you did what he said. I mean, and as far as food is concerned, one thing he used to say was all the time, you know, what you were eating got you where you are. You know, I'm not gonna completely change, I'm not gonna change your diet, because I don't know what it is. I can remember going in 64, going to Tokyo, and Coach Temple and I always thought, I was too small, you're just too small. I get to Tokyo, I think I gained five pounds, but he says, 
you need to push away from that table. <laughs> I think I went to Tokyo, I was wearing 125, and I went to 130, and he just thought I was huge there. I'm like, couldn't couldn't please him like that. So, but basically, he just made sure that he just, you know, with me, I just know I, I, I was just a picky eater and all those kinds of things. So he was concerned on that, but pretty much he just kind of let us eat. Well, you had to eat what was in the dining hall. You didn't have yeah. anything else to eat, unless, you know, your parents also send you a big old goodie Good box, box. <laughs> and, you, and you eat all those good sweets and things, and that's about it. But no, he was, he was never concerned about weight. There were a few girls that had a little bit of weight problem, but nope. He would say, I'll put you in the shop foot. That's what he would tell us. <laughs> <laughs> he did. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm just curious, so what what do you think you guys would be doing if you didn't do track? Like, what did you study in college? Because you guys were pretty blessed to have, like, a pretty supportive coach, and you had that track as an avenue to get, to open that door and then keep it open, but not a lot of, like, like you said, it's rare that black women or children and uh, were able to even have that opportunity or were even into sports, so you guys were pretty lucky to have that avenue. So, like, if you didn't do track or wasn't into sports, what, would you even still go to college or what did you study? If, since you were there, you had that, you guys were pretty lucky, so. Well, I had an older sister, uh, my older sister, she uh, went to Spelman. So, I don't know if I had wanted to go to Spelman. This is a great school, but at that time, Spelman was real, it was all women's school, so it was quite different. But I'm pretty sure I would have gone to college because of my, my uh, older sister. And my mother didn't want any of us to do what she did. My father uh, worked for the railroad, but my mother was a maid. She, she worked for a family, um, uh, Dr. Smith and Mrs. Smith, and they had two, two uh, uh, girls. One girl is, is uh, my age. So I share a little of uh, um, I get a little emotional sometimes when I think about it because my mother worked very hard. She was a maid. She made $35 a week in car fare. And that's how they used to say it, $35 a week in car fare. And she worked Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. She was off on Thursdays, um, worked Friday and Saturday, and off on Sunday. And, but, and, I, and I don't know how she did it. She was able to send me money, a little money, at Tennessee, when I was at Tennessee State. But she never wanted us to do that. And so I had the sister who went to, to Spelman. So I'm pretty sure I, I, I would have gone to college. And I have a sister, the one that's eight years older than me. She married, when well, she went to college, she married, had kids. And then she went back to college, and she finished school um, in her 30s and she taught school. I taught school um, my first year out of, out of college, um, making, a, I had a college degree, making barely $5,000 a year. I had an extra job, I'm not gonna tell you what it was. <laughs> <laughs> to buy gas for my we'll car. We'll talk after. I, I stayed at home with my mother, gave her $50, my car note was like 120 something a month. A brand new car, had a new car, $120. Pay. Three years to pay for it. You all don't know anything about that. <laughs> Three years to pay for that car. I think my insurance was about $300 a year for that car. So I taught school. Uh, Coach Temple, I don't know how he heard about it. But after the riots in Detroit in 67, they had a government program that they started. And he called me, someone had called him, he called me, and so told me about it. I called them, and I was hired. Double my salary, almost. I think I was making about 9000 And I was able to move to Detroit. What made it easy was that I had a sister living in Detroit. So I moved to Detroit, and um, it was making about 9000 So this was a government program, they call it, it was a government program where we train the unemployables. And this was after the, the riot in Detroit in 60, in uh, 67. 
So they had all of these uh, young people out of, fresh out of college, and they said to us, don't discuss your salary, <laughs> you know, with the other person. So, yeah, you know we did. <laughs> so then we found out people were making 10, 11, 12,000. So then they had to bring all of us up to like 12,000. <laughs> so, you know, I thought I was really making money. Then I went from 5,000 to $12,000 a year. But I did that for about a year, about, about 18 months, and the, the program slowly folded after that. And then uh, I taught school in Detroit for about eight years. And um, after that, I married in 67. And my husband, I moved to Detroit. He followed me. He wasn't my husband. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we got married in 67. And I stayed in, we stayed in Detroit for like 10 years, where he spent two years in service. He ended up going to Vietnam. And uh, thank God he made it back home. And I have to say this, in November, we'll be married 50 years. <laughs> but um, while in Detroit, uh, my husband decided that he wanted to do a business. And um, we started with McDonald's. He said, well, we'll sent an application into McDonald's, and we did that, and we were accepted. So for 27 years, and that's the way I got to California, was McDonald's. We um, got a store in, in Oakland. And um, for 27 years, uh, I sold hamburgers. <laughs> and uh, we ended up with six restaurants, and we retired in 2005, and we had five restaurants. I have no children, so we had no one to really passed the business on to. We tried family, no one was interested, so we sold and mm. really tried now and just trying to enjoy each day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's where my you know, my career path. Did you did you already what did you guys major in? Like what was your major in college? My major was elementary education oh, okay. and uh, minor in health. Okay. Well, mine is a lot different than that. I, I told you earlier, I grew up on a dairy farm, and it was no way for my parents to really send me to college. I think my mom, my mom worked at a dry cleaners, and she worked six days a week from seven to five every day. And I think she may have made $20 a week. Mm -hmm. And my father, I don't really remember him ever, well, they didn't give paychecks, getting any money, <laughs> getting a dollar. I'm sure we, he gave him something, because we lived free on the farm. We didn't have to pay for anything. So it wasn't very much money because everything else was free while we were. Um, I would have never gone to college. It was just that simple. And so I am really grateful and happy that the fact that Coach Temple saw me and gave me the opportunity to, to, be, to get an education. Uh, not that I knew that's what I really needed, but they need, my parents knew I needed it. And they wanted me to go to school. They, I was the only one to go, and I had three older brothers. I was the only one to go. And so they really wanted me to go to school. And while we were in school, uh, I had a brother that was in the Army, so he would send a dollar or two here and there. But most of the money went back to my mom because uh, it was just my mom and my dad had gone, passed on. So it was, a lot of that had been back home to them. But um, So I went to school, I got a degree in recreation. I, after the 68 Olympics, I moved to California. I saw California at age 15. Los Angeles, and I said then that I wanted to live in California, that's where I'm coming, and that was my goal. And when I graduated from college in 68, I, um, I wanted to graduate from college, go to the Olympics, and move to California. <laughs> <laughs> and it all happened for me <laughs> in that order. I graduated from college, went to the Olympics, <laughs> and um, moved to California, and uh, I've been living here ever since. I've had several jobs. I don't even want to go through <laughs> all of them, but I retired five years ago from working with, uh, with Los Angeles Unified School District. I, was, I worked in outdoor education, and basically what it was to have young people, uh, fifth and fourth, uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders coming to a camp, stay for a week, and we taught all the natural sciences, and uh, it was an outdoor setting, so it was a lot of hands-on and camping, and but 
indoor, I slept indoors, we didn't sleep outdoors. <laughs> and camping and just, you know, just learning about the science and learning who you are and also teaching you. What was really fun for me was letting, getting young kids to see that nature is really beautiful and we do need to take care of this planet in which we live. I grew up on a farm, so I know a little about a lot about the plants, and I was happy and eager to share that with young people. And I did that job for 17 years. And before that, I did so many other jobs. We won't start, but they were a lot of fun jobs too. Hi. Um, you guys have been through so many different trials and tribulations with your own life and what's going on in society and the world. Um, what is, for both of you, um, a surprising life lesson that you could share with us? Not something, not the cliche, you know, like we get, I understand the work hard and being an athlete, but anything kind of unexpected or surprising? Surprising. <laughs> When you say, I don't try to figure out surprising, but every day is a surprise. <laughs> I mean, surprise, I don't know, what you, maybe if you could elaborate a little maybe, bit. Maybe uh, just something that you yourself didn't um, expect to learn along the way through all the oh, things that okay. you've accomplished that now you can look back and say, yeah, you know. Well, I know one thing I never expected to be in business. <laughs> My sister taught school and then, you know, I was teaching. I figured that was where I was going to probably spend all my working career as, as a teacher because only I taught in Atlanta, I taught in Detroit, and also taught in uh, South Carolina because um, my husband was in service. And I talked about Atlanta salary when I went to to Columbia, South Carolina. I went there as a second year teacher. My take home was three oh seven a month. $307. I didn't meet any young teachers in Columbia, South Carolina. All the teachers were, were, were older teachers. Mm -hmm. But I never thought of being in business. And even when my husband had the idea of going into business, I mean, I asked him, I said, you think we can do this? And he looked at me, yeah, we can do it. All these other people, you know, are doing it. And you know, we, McDonald's took us through a training program, but that training, we didn't really learn anything until we got in the store. <laughs> and, and, and it was like the store closed on a December 31st, 1977. It opened up on January 1, 1978. And it was ours. We opened up at one o'clock and it was the weirdest feeling. And we had worked with the people for a month in that store. And in a matter of a day, we were their boss. And uh, that was, I would say, something that I had never expected to do. And it was a big learning experience. We learned on the job, really learned on the job. And we did it for 27 years, and I really, it was a great experience. Um, my husband did basically the operations and I did the paperwork and the people. He didn't want to be bothered with people, so I could work with them, <laughs> and I could work with the, the, the young people. And my teaching experience in junior high really helped me because I was working mo mainly with 16-year-olds and 17-year-olds in the very beginning. And so that in that I had taught in junior high for a few years, it really helped. Because I think if I had gone in there and had not had any dealings with young people, I don't know if I could have made it. But that was probably one of the surprising things in my life that I never in, in any would have thought that I would own a business. Well, for me, I guess the most, I mean, I don't think it's one surprising. The fact that I'm sitting here speaking is surprising. <laughs> you would never know it. I, Mr. Temple would always say, you don't talk, Tyus. He always called us by our last name. He would say, Tyus, you don't talk. Uh, we, before he uh, passed away, we had been in Nashville and we was at a dinner and he says, he gets up and he said, well, in the five years that Tyus was here, I think I heard four words from him. <laughs> <laughs> so it's surprising that I, I learned to really feel okay in sharing my story or where, where I am. I 
I guess the other surprising thing is that I have learned so much on the way and that I've learned that who I am and it's, you know, to be very proud of who I am. Not that I wasn't, but just to know that other people are, are proud of what I did. I mean, because I just think, well, we all have goals. We all want to accomplish our goals. And when we do, we all want to be appraised by our goals. We were in a situation where we got to be able to, we could stand on a victory stand and the world could see us and, and give us the praise and all, but we all have that. It may not be televised, you know, like the revolution is not televised, but, you know, but, you know, that's the key, I guess that's the most surprising thing and that I could also be a part of an, or starting an organization, a Women's Sports Foundation, and never thinking what was happening to me that will, you know, be a stepping stool to start something like the Women's Sports Foundation, and give women the courage to do more, give young women the courage to do. And the same thing as for as people of color, to give them an opportunity to say, hey, we can do it too. And especially, you know, black women, and, and just women in general, and black, you know, just that somewhere along the line, you know, I, people, there are people out there have looked up to what I've stood for, what I've stand for, and that uh, it was not just on the track field, but in life in general, and just, we have to respect all, and that, and we were just brought up that way, you respect all, you want, you treat people which, the way you would like to be treated, and you, and you learn as much as you can from other people, other cultures, other ethnicities. And I just never thought that would happen. I mean, I was growing up on a dairy farm, I was learning a lot about cows and plants and trees. <laughs> and and it, it, that came in handy because for 17 years I worked outdoors. So yeah. all of that is surprising. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, know, you so I much. And I just want to share that your work has actually gone on and affected me. And I've worked with the Women's Sports Foundation and mm. I've been able to uh, create my own career in, women, in the women's sports industry. So thank you so much for sharing your story and getting over your fear of speaking. <laughs> okay. Thank you. No, I think so also that I don't think when we started out running, and even after we went to the Olympics, mm -hmm. that we weren't thinking that, okay, we were running because we enjoyed it and we wanted to win. But I don't think we thought this far in advance that we would, at, at mm -mm age, <laughs> that we would, someone would still be interested in us or that, I don't think we knew what we were doing at that time, the magnitude of winning a gold medal. I don't think we knew that it would expand throughout our life right. like this. I really don't, I hadn't thought that far. No. Yeah. And we weren't coached that way. Not only were we not no. coached that way, our parents didn't bring us up that way. Yeah. They taught us to be hard workers and they felt, they taught us that if you did, if you, you know, put your heart into it. If you work hard enough, you're gonna get, you're gonna get your dues, so to speak. And when I say dues, you're gonna get paid more. <laughs> you got paid more as you continue and all those kinds of things. But we were never looking, well, we didn't see the sight that young people have now that are involved in sports or in anything in life that, hey, I can do this. This can be, this can be accomplished, you know. And you, you have an opportunity to, to see people that look like you that is accomplishing those things. So that, Makes the you know makes the playing feel a little bit better because you can say I can attain that. When we were competing, that was that we didn't you know when it came to women. We asked who is your hero? Um, <laughs> <laughs> my brothers, <laughs> you know my parents. They were my heroes and sheroes. But you know we didn't have what you young people have today. Okay. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, it's my pleasure as well to be in two women's company who are Olympic winners because I'm a baby boomer era mm -hmm. and I lived through seeing the events on TV and hearing people talk about them as well. My question is, I heard you say you played basketball as well as you know, running and all kind of sports. And I would like to know, why did you choose track and field to go into for your sports instead of basketball? 
Well, because there was no basketball, basketball <laughs> team to go to. <laughs> At that time, it was only, in only, only Tennessee State, black or white college, had track. Tennessee State was the only school. We ran against track clubs. And then there was no basketball after, after high school. We just participated in basketball in high school, but there was no school to go. So we were all before, way before Title IX. And Tuskegee had had a track team um, before. Uh, when Coach Temple started coaching in the 50s, Tuskegee had a track team too. And they competed against each other. But when we started running, Tuskegee's uh, track program had fell. Now I was coached by, in high school, I was coached by Mildred McDaniel. She won a gold medal in Melbourne in 1956 in the high jump. And she coached me uh, in basketball. She taught school and she coached in basketball. And you know, when I think about it, no one made a real big deal about Ms. McDaniel being a gold medalist. In, um, and she was from Atlanta, Georgia. And no one made a really big, big deal about the fact that she had won a gold medal in 1956 in the Olympics. And a lot of these people, she was only recognized later on in life. Yeah. She's deceased now, but she was recognized in some, you know, events later on. But when you think of, when I think about it, she coached me. But there was no basketball no. to go to. <laughs> yeah, once she graduated from high school, that was it. And to show you how mature, how basketball has grown, because right. when we first started playing basketball, oh, that was, <laughs> you had three guards and you had three forwards. And then you know how the basketball court, you had three guards on this side and you had three forwards on the other side. And you could only dribble the ball twice and you had to pass it off. And if this, you could never go back and forth across the line. So that's how, that's how basketball was when we first started. By the time we got to high school, by the time we were graduating from high school. Well, when I still was that way when I graduated. We, we were able to, they did the unlimited dribble before I left. <laughs> and then the year after I graduated from high school, they had what they called the rolling, rolling. guard. So you guys. had a guard that could go over. But they, again, with girls, they figured girls could not run up and down the court. When we were, sweat. Yes. <laughs> when we were in high school, the longest race in high school was 100 yards for girls. There was no 200 yards uh, for girls. You know, so they cut everything. They figured girls could only do certain things. They had the 50, 75, and the 100 is what girls uh, ran in high school. And then eventually they added the 200, the 400, and um, all, the, all the races now. Yeah. It's crazy, yeah. We've got time for Susan, and then we'll go one in the back. <laughs> um, first of all, it's just such an honor to be here today with both of you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I wanted to ask if you could speak, um, Wyoming, to your experience in, at the, um, it was the 1968 games in Mexico City, in right? In Mexico City? Yeah, when your teammates, uh, John Carlos and Tommy Smith, were expelled from the games because of their peaceful protest. Mm -hmm. And I understand you um, made a statement, you dedicated, was it the, your, the relay team that dedicated their gold medal to your teammates? Mm -hmm. to, if you could speak to your experience at those games, and then I just wondered what both of you thought of the current um, um, the statements that athletes are taking in sports this year in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement. That's a lot to talk to. <laughs> I felt like we'd be remiss not to talk about it. <laughs> I'll see what I can do. Yeah. Um, well, 68, 1968 Olympics, um, there was a plan, trying to plan a boycott. It first started as a black, as far as black athletes boycotting the Olympics uh, because all the unjust things that were happening to blacks and not just here, but all over. And then it got to be, before we went to the Olympics, it, 
change to human rights, because that's what we were really talking about. It was not just blacks being mistreated, it was so many people being mistreated throughout the world. And that way, it, it changed because you needed more people in the movement, so to speak. Uh, and nobody knew what they were gonna do if they were going to the Olympics, but it wind up that no one, it was never pulled, you know, we never boycotted, we went. And John Carlos and Tommy Smith, um, what, well, let's go back. Oh, it, while at the Olympic Village, <laughs> there were a lot of talks of what are the athletes going to do, how are we going to protest, and show our, door, uh, show our support, uh, put it that way. And no one could, we can come up with a sound way for everybody to do it. So it was like, well, you do what you want to do. And then Carlos, uh, Tommy and Carlos, once they went out on the victory stand and they did the Black Power salute, then it was all over. It was nothing for it, really anybody else to do. I think that said it all for what anybody that was thinking that was part of the movement that wanted something to happen, that happened. Uh, now, the Olympic Committee said they were going to take their medals, and then even in this day and time, you can read my right places, they took their medals. I'm like, I can't take their medals. <laughs> <laughs> They're not going to give them up. But so, which they did not take their medals. They would put out the village, yes. They, they wanted to, they talked about putting them out the country. No, they couldn't put them out the country. That wasn't their country. So, so they stayed in a hotel. Um, I dedicated my relay medal to them in support of the whole movement and all that. That's how that came about. That, And, you know, each athlete could have done what we, other athletes wore black socks, they wore black berets, they wore bands, they wore black shorts, you name it. And they are, but they wanted to do it, and that's how the protests. Now, what was the other question? Oh, got <laughs> Okay. So the question was about what current athletes are doing um, in terms of Black Lives Matter movements and others, the political stances they're taking? Well, I think you know, it goes back to what I said earlier about we all, uh, Mr. Temple just didn't want you to be an athlete. And, that, and you know, you had to be abreast of what's going on in the world. You have to make some stand somewhere and you, and whatever it be. I mean, I feel that as an athlete, whoever you are, whatever athlete is making a stand, if that's their belief and they want to do that, that's great. I believe in the whole Black Lives Matter movement because I grew up in, again, the South, and I grew up with a lot of things that are happening in the day, what's happened to young black men, what happening then, and nobody was speaking on it. It was just, okay, that just gets slung up. Nobody talks about it, and now, people are speaking up and we are in a generation where people can catch a lot of things on camera and all those and then the time that I was growing up that was not happening so I, I, I have a 36 year old son and he's 6'5 so when he was in high school and he was growing up I had to talk about him if he gets stopped by police the first thing you do you keep your hands on the steering wheel okay <laughs> All right, you know, and you you don't even move. I mean, talking through the window, I would say, you tell him, I am going to roll my window down. I'm using my left hand, and then, you know, you ha we I did that, and it's always yes sir, yes yes sir, yes ma'am. You know, just don't do anything because we never know. I mean, my brothers had my parents had to talk that way to them, and you know, it was a lot worse. I think. When I was when my brothers and I were growing up, but uh, a lot has changed, and I, it's good to see athletes coming to the forefront and making a stance because a lot of more people see them. Mm -hmm. That means that a lot more people learn about what's going on, and and it's not like hearsay. This say, and they, you know, when you come together as a group and you become united, you get a lot more accomplished. And I think when, and when people see the cause and know what, and you get more information, that helps the cause. I hope I answered it, I said, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, time for one more in the back. Mm -hmm. 
Hello, thank you for coming. I'm uh, really happy that you guys are here. Uh, I just have a question. From the Olympics now, how the support they get from the U.S. and just the world itself, what was the environment like in Tokyo? Did you guys feel any support from any, like, did any U.S. You know, supporters come and, like, did you get support from other Olympic athletes that come to your events? Like, just the general, you know, feeling of being in Tokyo and being a U.S. athlete. I mean, the question was about what sort of general support that yeah. they feel as Olympians from yeah. the U.S. Yeah. government? Yeah, for U.S. or just U.S. people in general. US like, Because, you know, a lot of people come to the events in different countries. U.S. supporters would come. Did you feel any support from other, like, U.S., like, any other U.S. supporters in the Tokyo Olympics? U.S. support in the Tokyo Games. U.S. support. Yeah, I mean, there were a lot of support. I mean, you're talking people that, well, like in... In Tokyo, in, there was um, there's an army base. That's we actually far. stayed in an yeah, old, old army base. Old army base. <laughs> an old army barracks. <laughs> we sure did. Uh, but as far as people there supporting the U.S., yes. As far as Americans there supporting us, yes, they were there. Mm -hmm. Is that what you were asking us? Yes. Uh, there were also the Okinawa or something. Like, they had an uh, army camp or something. The soldiers were there in Japan someplace, mm -hmm. and they came to the, the you know, I've I run across people a lot of times say, you know, I was in Tokyo, I was in the service then, I saw you run, I got to be, you know, it, so that was, it was always very supportive, I feel. I mean, you, I, it's, we talk about a lot of things. I think when the Olympics come around, people look at you and they say, oh, this is you great, you're great, great. And then after a year, they don't know. But, <laughs> but basically, I shouldn't say that, but basically they, there was always support. And I, I know in our communities, there was always yeah. support. I'll put it that way. I had the opportunity uh, when we was in Tokyo, there was someone that grew up in my neighborhood and he was in service over there. And he came to the base, well, it was Olympic Village, Village yeah. and he came and he found me and I got a chance to see him. And then another experience I had, my husband and I have gone to a few Olympics and we go uh, with this group called, it's in Mountain View, um, Track and Field News. And one of the couples that, um, we went to Beijing and one of the couples that was there, they've been going to Olympics forever and they told me that they saw me run in uh, Tokyo in 64. So that was really, you know, it was a really great experience. So, you know, Americans are traveling and following the, the U.S. teams in all sports mm -hmm. around the world during the Olympic, um, yeah. Olympic years. And I think you see more of it now because yeah. also the Olympic Committee are helping a lot of the athletes, like I, the potential winners, they think, mm -hmm. I say, you know, so if they want, so in track, if you want first or second place in the Olympic trials, you go into the Olympics, they help your parents or your relatives go. And not only that, it's a lot more lucrative now because mm -hmm. now the shoe companies pay. They didn't pay when we were running. <laughs> they pay for you to be in their shoes and they pay for your, you know, you, that could be part of your contract that you want your family to come. Mm -hmm. So you get a lot more Americans going to the Olympics than probably years ago, like in 64. And I think, I think in 68 when I went to Mexico City, I've had so many people come up to me and say, I was in Mexico City when you were mm -hmm. in. I was in Mexico City than I did when I was in 64. So people, and not, you know, the travel was made a lot easier and all those kinds of things. And again, the companies, and not only that, not just the shoe companies, all companies, you know, they want their products sold and they want those people. And so they're bringing them in and they're doing a whole lot of things. A lot of companies bring in their best customers to the Olympic Games and have them be there, be there, and have some athletes work as ambassadors, so to speak, they show them about the Olympics, tell them about the Olympics. They're confused about an event or something. You're sitting in the stands with them, you're able to talk with them and share that. So a lot of that has happened, especially in, on the U.S. part. I don't know about other countries. But you actually did something like that in Yeah, I did it in Los Angeles. I worked for uh, SI. <laughs> <laughs> I worked for SI then. <laughs> 
not to write, but as an ad, uh, as ambassador, so to speak, and also worked for Coca-Cola, like to say. But Coca-Cola was a lot different. Coca-Cola was a year prior to the Olympic Games. Where they hired three women to go around the U.S. Uh, encouraging young women to get young women to get involved in sports uh, and uh, to talk about our experience, talk about the good, the bad, and uh, not so good. <laughs> Um, thank you all for coming. I'd like to ask two things of you before you go. There's a very short quiz, no, not a quiz, <laughs> a, a survey that I wish that you'd please fill out and just leave on your seat. The other thing I'd ask that you do is spread the word about the Tennessee State Tiger Bells, the greatest team that we've never heard about. Thank you for coming. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.